Today we're going to jump right into the heart of my work. This episode is for anyone who has ever loved and lost. It's for anyone who has ever felt sorrow, which basically means everyone who is listening to this right now. You're listening to Unscripted with Nell Daly. Thank you so much, guys, for joining us. This is the first episode of Unscripted, and we have a great show lined up for you today. Today's episode is partially supported by Quero Shoes. This is such a great company, I have to tell you. I'm so proud to be aligned with them. Let me tell you a little bit about Quero Shoes. They're handmade shoes for men and women, crafted by Spanish artisans, who use only the finest materials from Italy and France and Spain. Cuero has made it simple for you to buy a classic upscale shoe that is literally custom designed by you. So how do you do this? You simply go to Cuero, that's Q-U-E-R-O-H-M-S dot com. You pick out a style you love, and man, do they have some gorgeous styles to choose from. I was on their website, and it's really off the hook. It's awesome. And then build your shoes to fit your own taste and measurements. You can actually pick the laces you want, the heel size, even the exact color of the leather. This is an old way to make shoes, but a new way to buy them. If that's not enough, they even offer free shipping in the U.S. and free returns. That's awesome. And when you sign up for their newsletter, you get an extra 15% off with your purchase. Again, go to QueroHMS.com to learn more. That's Q-U-E-R-O-H-M-S dot com to learn more. Today's episode is with the author of this incredible book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, psychotherapist Francis Weller. He's literally written one of the most profound books I've ever read, which says a lot because for those of you guys who listen to the pre-episode, I'm an avid reader. If there was a book list called Required Life Reading, which I just came up with off the top of my head, I would put his book, The Wild Edge of Sorrow, on top of it, hands down. And here's why. Every person who has ever walked into my office, every person you know and I know, including yourself, has faced sorrow and loss and loneliness that sometimes feels immeasurable. And in our society today, in our Western society, We have lost the ability to know how to handle those feelings without medicating it away, either by using drugs or drinking or through sex or through shopping or by popping pills like Xanax and Clonopin. We are all being taught to want to numb our pain. We are sold happiness at every turn, and if we aren't happy, we are somehow failing. I would actually argue the opposite. We fail ourselves when we don't let ourselves feel our entire emotional spectrum, both the highs and the lows. I think the greatest human travesty of our time is the over-medication of our society. And you'll continue to understand why I feel this way as you listen to more and more episodes of Unscripted as they're released. In his book, he quotes Carl Jung, Embrace your grief, for there your soul will grow. I actually, when I first read that, wrote it down on a little piece of paper and put it up on the inspiration board that sits above my desk in my bedroom. Weller argues that on this wild edge of sorrow, we actually feel incredibly alive, which is something I hadn't thought of before, and that we can learn to welcome rather than fear pain of loss. Which translates into this question, can you imagine living a life with less fear of emotional pain? Because let's face it, emotional pain is inevitable. Francis Weller, and I've certainly found this to be true in all the work I've done, argues that there are great gifts in the pain we are often seeking to avoid. As Albert Camus says, live to the point of tears. This book was filled with revelations for me. Every page is underlined. I literally felt something tugging at my soul, and I don't mean to sound overly dramatic here, but I felt something tugging at my soul the entire time while I read it. And what I felt when I meditated on it was the truth, the truth of our human experience jumping off the page, a human experience many of us have become completely disconnected from. I was so nervous to interview him. I really felt 
during the entire interview that he was channeling something. And I feel that way when I read his work as well. There's just, it's, it's unbelievable. It's almost superhuman. I believe he could be one of the greatest spiritual thinkers of our time. So without further ado, Francis Weller. So I'm talking today to Francis Weller. He is the author of a book called The Wild Edge of Sorrow. And uh, in your own words, you say there is, a, there is some strange intimacy between grief and aliveness, some sacred exchange between what seems unbearable and what is most exquisitely alive. So welcome to the show, Francis. I'm so happy to have you. Thank you, Nell. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So what was the premise of the book? What did you want to teach or share to people uh, when you wrote this? I think my main concern was to try to bring uh, a soulful approach to grief work. Mm -hmm. It was rapidly becoming very clinical, mm -hmm. and grief was beginning to be seen as a problem to be solved, mm -hmm. something wrong. And uh, to the soul, to the psyche, grief is an extension of being alive. If we are going to engage the world in any meaningful way, if our hearts are going to be open to the world in any meaningful way, we will know loss. And so learning how to be with loss, to be with sorrow in a open way, in a responsive way, felt very important for people to learn again. It's as if we have forgotten so much of what it meant to be human. Mm -hmm. We forgot all the commons of the soul, and grieving together is one of the commons of the soul, and we've forgotten that. Mm -hmm. And did you come to this discovery through your work with patients? Is that, is that why you were called to do this work? Was there a, sort of an epiphany moment for you where you thought, uh, I need to, I would argue, be one of the fathers and one of the front rather, runners of a a sort of burgeoning field in, in our work called soul psychology. My mentors played a huge role in how I approached the work. Mm -hmm. The fact that I'm dealing with grief, I never volunteered for the position. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was drafted by my own losses, by my own encounters with uh, a wide assortment of grief, and I couldn't ignore it. I mean... Um, it was a persistent melancholy in my being mm -hmm. that drew me to soul work. Mm -hmm. And understanding that melancholy rather than trying to outrun it mm -hmm. or try to distract myself from it or try to rise above it, which is a lot of what psychology is about these days, but actually turning toward it and finding an intimacy within grief was quite revelatory. So I came to that work out of my own losses, my own grief, and then began to reimagine the work that I was doing in, the, in my practice. Uh, because I think we're all taught as therapists that our job is to help alleviate symptoms. Mm -hmm. But one of my teachers, James Hillman, said, in your symptoms are your soul's deepest desires. So if I'm trying to rid symptoms, I'm also helping them lose contact with soul. So I began to begin to see that within all of what was coming in the door, primarily self-described symptoms of depression, was actually oppression. It was the weight of untouched sorrow that was accumulating like sediment on people's lives, weighing them down, depriving them of any true sense of being alive or any access to joy. So grief became a long-standing uh, theme in the work that I was doing. But then I learned more about the role of grief and community and ritual mm -hmm. in the mid-1990s through my friendship with Maladoma Somme and uh, began to see how indigenous cultures uh, invite grief into the very heart of the village. And we tend to exile grief to the very edge of the village. And so learning how to bring grief back into not only my practice, but then into community practices has been a big part of my uh, of my life. Mm -hmm. Long it, answer. It's a beautiful, incredible answer. My heart is pounding as you're talking because it speaks so deeply to everything that I've experienced as a therapist in my office that has not been expressed, I think, at, for, coming from me. Coming from my patients, I always felt this, but it was sorely missing in my clinical training 
this this truer sense of of what the work is really about, which is communing with someone else's soul. In fact, I I went to NYU and have psychoanalytic training from some of the best institutes in New York, and we never talked about soul, except a few times when Jung was mentioned. And, And it always felt amiss to me. Once you get in the room and start doing the intimate work, so much of it is about grief. You... You you are doing this work, and you have been doing this work for how many years now? Thirty five. Thirty five years, and so you've seen then the trajectory of our careers, you know, change, or the trajectory of our patients' lives change because of of pharmaceuticals, which are really there to deaden pain. So here you are running towards grief and saying we need to examine it and put it under a microscope and really open it up. As you say, we, I believe it was your words where you say we meet our souls at the shrine of grief. And here, so many of our patients, 80 million Americans, one out of every four women in their childbearing years, is on psychiatric medication now, really to deaden pain. Can you speak to that a little bit? I believe that that is um, so entangled with the absence of community. Mm-hmm. When we're taught from birth on, basically, that you're on your own, that you must muscle your way through your life, your losses, your sorrows, uh, your divorces, your deaths, on your own. That's the, that's the almost inevitable outcome of that kind of um, circumstance, because we can't. Mm. You know, the, the, the fact is we're designed for a communal response to sorrow. Grief has always been communal. And suddenly in the last oh, 100 or so years, we've begun to privatize everything. If you noticed that we're very big on privatization in this culture, we want to privatize the water system. We want to privatize the Medicare. We want to privatize Social Security. But one of the worst parts is in psychology, we've also learned to privatize our own emotions. And so you go to a private practice to deal with your emotions. You go one-on-one, almost like in a secretive way, which is fine, by the way. I think it's important to learn to tolerate contact in the context of therapy. But ultimately, we need a much wider context to encounter our sorrows. We were not meant to uh, bear the weight of things on our own. In indigenous cultures, Jeanette Armstrong, a wonderful Akhenaten elder from uh, Canada, northern Washington up into Canada, said that in the indigenous culture, community comes first, family second, and the individual comes last. Mm -hmm. In that cosmology, you are well covered. No matter what happens in your lifetime, you are covered. We have inverted that entirely in this culture. It's the individual on top, family second, and community has become this abstract rhetoric that we talk about all the time, but we don't have an embodied feeling for it. Mm-hmm. So we still feel very alone and very isolated under the weight of privatization, private pain, private suffering, private redemption. You've got to do it all on your own. And if you don't, you're screwed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so when you talk about community grieving, can you break that down for a listener who isn't familiar with our work? What do you mean when you say community grieving? Well, community grieving is the primal matrix. It's, it's the way in which we always dealt with loss. Uh, when we do it, it means that we gather for three days and we uh, have people come from all over the country. We have people coming from the East Coast, from Canada, from, I mean, it's, it's wonderful they're coming, mm-hmm. but it's also symptomatic of a profound loss. Mm-hmm. And these are with that, the retreats that you run, just to make sure. Right, these are the grief, grief ritual yeah. retreats that we run. Mm-hmm. And so what happens in that setting is that people begin to feel the commonality. No matter what the sorrows are that walk in the door, whether it's the death of an infant whether it's the end of a marriage, whether it's uh, dealing with cancer, whether it's um, the death of a parent by suicide or whatever it is, 
what is recognized is that we all know loss. Mm -hmm. And we are all sharing this common sense of sorrow. And by doing it communally, we begin to suture the tear in the psyche of having to carry this all alone for so long. Mm -hmm. And I watch time and time and time again the relief in people's hearts when they are restored to that old matrix of weeping side by side with a brother or a sister. Mm -hmm. That I'm no longer required to carry this singularly, but I can now be held by others and I can hold others. And together we empty the communal cup of sorrow rather than having to drag mine around. I've noticed, and I'm sure you have too now, that people are still grieving pieces of their life that are sometimes decades old, mm -hmm. in part because they're waiting for the signal to be sent that the containment has been provided, and their only job now in this moment is to weep, mm -hmm. is, to, is to release the grief. Until we get that signal, we have to do both jobs at once, containment and release. Mm -hmm. And we can't do both jobs, so we become a permanent containment field for sorrow. And we just simply recycle our grief over and over and over. We chew the same bone for an entire lifetime sometimes, mm -hmm. never being able to set it down. We're still waiting to get the signal that the containment has been made, the field is set. I only have one job to do today, which is to weep. Mm -hmm. And so often in our culture, we don't give ourselves time to do this. Forget about trying to find a community to do it in. We do not create space in our, in our culture, in our days, to actually honor our sorrow. And you talk a lot in the book about developing as adults one thing that we need to learn how to do. And this was a very profound part of the book for me, and I've taught it now to many patients, and it's alleviated quite a bit of pain, is an apprenticeship with sorrow, that we must develop an apprenticeship with sorrow. Can you explain that? The idea of an apprenticeship was slow in my imagination, um, but what it meant was that we wanted to re begin to reimagine grief not as a singular event, mm -hmm. not a, a period of mourning, but it's going to be an ongoing relationship for the rest of your life. Every day you will encounter something that will touch sorrow's strings, whether it's roadkill on the side of the road, whether it's a homeless person you encounter on the street, whether it's the current news of environmental devastation, whether it's a cancer diagnosis that comes near you, every day you'll be touched by grief. And if we're unprepared or unskilled at dealing with it, we will consistently be rolled underground by the weight of it. So the apprenticeship is about developing the skill of grieving. So grief is not just an emotion, it's also a capacity. It's a faculty of being human, which for most of us is very undeveloped. And the you, old idea of a, go ahead. You talk about being rolled under by it or completely ignoring it, which is what many people do when they, they numb it. And I guess in a way that's being rolled under it by it as well, but that comes out in the forms of addiction and yes. uh, reckless behavior, self-destructive behavior, self-loathingness. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The old idea of apprenticeship was obviously from the uh, Middle Ages where you would become... You would, t you would undertake a long process of, of apprenticeship to become a, a weaver or a farrier or a, a stonemason or a, car a carpenter. And at the end of that so long process, you'd be declared a master of that skill. In soul language, what I talk about is if you take, undertake this apprenticeship with sorrow, in the long term, if you are diligent in your practice, if you hold the vigil with sorrow, in the long run, you'll be turned into an elder, someone capable of metabolizing sorrow, not just your own and not only for yourself, but also on behalf of the community and behalf of the commons and behalf of the watershed. Part of what we are most desperately in need of right now, Nell, are men and women 
who have the capacity to turn into the winds of sorrow, digest it, and bring back medicine to the village, medicine to the community. Our young people are dying at an extraordinary rate from suicide, from overdose, from terrible circumstances, in part because they feel no one's there to help hold their grief for a world that is rapidly changing before their eyes. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of our spiritual responsibility is to become skillful in this apprenticeship I don't know if you want to go into the qualities of that apprenticeship now, or what would you like to do? I would, I would like to, because I think that when I start to talk to patients about the apprenticeship of grief, you can see across the couch from me, they sit up and they want to understand how to do this desperately. They want to understand how to do it as opposed to numbing or running from their pain. And they really feel that this concept calls out to something deep within them, that they're part of their journey on this planet that we want to do is to be the light, is to, to as you say, turn their face to that pain and then come out the other side in order then to be of help to other people, to be of service to others. So could you break down how one goes about developing that apprenticeship? I have my own, I've translated in my own language to sure, patients, sure. but I'd much rather hear it from the master himself. <laughs> the first step of that apprenticeship is developing a right relationship with sorrow. We tend to have a, for lack of better terms, a bipolar relationship with grief. We're either pushing it away or we're drowning in it. Neither one of them works. So we need to come into right relationship with sorrow, almost as if it's a companion walking beside us. That's the first skill. The second part of that apprenticeship is learning to take up some kind of practice, whether it's writing or meditation or prayer or knitting. I don't care what it is, but something that helps stabilize in the midst of the storm. Because grief will come. There's no doubt about it. Every one of us will know sorrow. When it comes... Are we going to be one of those situations where we're either pushing it away or drowning in it? The practice gives you stability. It gives you ballast. It gives you something to rely upon when the winds are really fierce so you don't get blown over. Mm. The third part of the apprenticeship and a really crucial piece is learning to migrate grief from a child's hands into an adult's hands. And what I mean by that is that for many of us, when we experienced grief in our childhood, it wasn't met very well. Mm -hmm. So something happened in that failure to be held adequately that kind of crystallized a belief structure around grief and also a strategic pattern around grief. And Frequently in the grief rituals or in my private practice, when grief shows up in someone's body, I'm suddenly looking at a five-year-old. Mm. I'm not dealing with an adult in that moment. Something has happened that has activated the old wound around grief or having to grieve alone. So there's, it's rare to have just grief show up. I'm often walking with grief panic with people grief, terror, and learning to develop this apprenticeship helps to peel off the panic piece of it so we can just simply deal with sorrow, just be with the grief. Mm -hmm. The fourth part of the apprenticeship is developing a, a qualitative relationship to silence and solitude. Uh, as much as I speak about community and the necessity of village there's also a richness that comes with uh, cultivating that silence and that solitude. Silence is a, a quality of hospitality. It's a quality of listening. So I, so I can hear the voices of the other ones who are inside there. The ones who are actually probably carrying my, my tears, my grief. And solitude is a form of sanctuary. It's a holding space. I remember one woman I was working with, and I tell the story in the book, who had recently gone through the end of a relationship and she hated going home at night because 
the house was going to be dark and cold. And so I asked her, could you imagine that is the most holy time of your day? She said, what do you mean? So can you imagine that when you open the door, you are meeting the most vulnerable part of yourself, this lonely, isolated woman? Could you imagine greeting her and saying, I'm home, and turn the lights on, light the fire, put some tea on? Can you make a place for this part of you? Then I remembered a line from the poet Rilke where he said, I am too alone in the world, but not alone enough to make every minute holy. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful move he makes. Mm -hmm. I am too alone in the world. We all know that place of feeling isolated and cut off. But then he makes this move, but not alone enough to make every minute holy. That's moving from isolation to solitude, mm -hmm. from being cut off to entering into sanctuary. It's a beautiful move he makes. Mm -hmm. It's, a, it's incredible, this quality you talk about, that in those deep, lonely moments where you're feeling pain, that you can re-envision it instead of feeling swallowed up by the pain. You talk in the book about having reverence for it. And I always think of reverence as a very holy word. And when you're alone in that solitude, having reverence for your sorrow and, and creating in your soul and in your space a sanctuary to grieve. And this is really antithetical to how we live now, right? We always have the television on, we always have social media going, we always have a million things, we're trying to fill our days as opposed to create any of that space to be quiet. And so many of my patients are even afraid to meditate or spend time alone because they're not used to doing it anymore. And so they really run from that. And when they do, they run from that deep voice of their soul that A, is calling out to be heard and expressed, sometimes just to grieve, sometimes to be creative, but also to know and understand what they're doing here on this earth. They, they lose that connection to their own soul, and, and it's such a fertile place when you're grieving to, to get to know yourself again. But it's about, I always say to my patients, I use a line from Elizabeth Lesser, one of her books, Broken Open, I say, just crack your heart open to it. You're, you're not going to die under the weight of that grief. You're going to be okay. Which leads me to sort of an in-between state that you talk about, which is you can, you can create a private sanctuary for your grief, and then there's community grief. But there's also, when you're in deep pain, you talk about this space of knowing that someone can go down into the rivers of grief with you. That it's healthy to have someone there to sort of hold your hand through it, even if it's metaphorically speaking, not in that exact moment, so you don't feel like you're going to drown in your pain. Absolutely. I think that feeling of being tethered is vital. Uh, it gives us faith that grief is not about wanting to take us hostage. Mm -hmm. It's actually a ripening territory. So we need that sense of being held sufficiently, adequately, so I can begin to turn again into my sorrow, toward it, with an open heart, with some sense of faith that the outcome, if we want to call it that, is a ripening. It's a deepening of my character. Mm -hmm. but I don't think we mature in some fundamental way without a deep understanding of the rights and customs of, of sorrow. And if we're avoiding that all the time, we end up with a culture of adolescence, which, huh, guess what? This is what we have. Yeah. <laughs> culture of adolescence. Yeah. yeah, I've often said to my patients now since reading your book that part of our job as mature adults is to learn how to have this relationship with our sorrow and with our grief. And to not, again, be swallowed by it, but not stand so far away from it that we don't feel it because it's going to come up for us every day. And in fact, we can reframe it to have our sorrows and the things that happen to us, the trauma, the losses, be our greatest spiritual teachers. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a hard one to do. Uh, I think the best we can do 
I don't want to say it that way. One of the things I think we're asked to do is to bring the softest touch possible to our suffering. Whether it's going to teach us something, I don't know. Sometimes it does, sometimes mm. it doesn't. Mm. But what we can do is come to it with, with compassion. Mm. This is the suffering I carry. It's, uh, we too often use our suffering as an act of definition or a kind of a commentary on our lives rather than simply what happened in my life. In other words, if I'm seeing it through the eyes of, well, these events happen, these things happen, so therefore I must be wrong or bad or inadequate or unlovable or whatever, there's no compassion in that approach. So that was the last part of the apprenticeship of sorrow is self-compassion. Mm -hmm. That we learn to hold our experience tenderly, kindly, mercifully, that we approach whatever comes into our lives, whatever comes into our lives with compassion. That allows the heart to stay soft and allows us again to keep digesting these sorrows. And what comes out of it is something quite exquisite, something beautiful, something elastic, something responsive to the world. See, it's one, I often say that our work is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then to be stretched large by these two things. If I keep my grief really small, my capacity for gratitude is also going to be compromised. But to only pick up one or the other, if I only pick up gratitude, there's a certain thinning of my capacity for compassion. And if I only pick up grief, I will become bitter over time. I will begin to become cynical and lose that sense of the beauty of life. But together, not only did they stretch us, but they also formed the prayer of life. You know, grief and gratitude side by side, constantly. Mm -hmm. You can walk out the door and see something heartbreaking, and right next to it will be a blossom opening on a cherry tree or a maple coming into its full color of fall, you know. They're always there, side by side enabling us to hold them both in greater and greater capacities. I think you answered the question that many of my patients would ask me, and they do ask me over and over again when I talk about the necessity of suffering for growth, is why <laughs> over and over again is the resistance to it. They don't want to surrender to their grief or their sorrow, and they keep asking why over and over again. And I think some of the most beautiful moments in, in the book are how you, you say through various chapters that we're meant to live in large pools, not shallow ones. That, and even in the title, The Wild Edges, you're not just talking about the wild edges of sorrow. You seem to me to be incredibly interested in the wild edges that we live on the other end of the spectrum as well. Because without one, we cannot have the other. Mm -hmm. Because what we are deeply drawn to in this life is not this concept of, and you brought it up at the beginning of the program, being happy or just a culture of positivity, especially in our field, helping people be more positive-minded. It's really about helping people be moved that we want to be moved in this life. We want to be dynamic and fluid and move from, to have a large, I always tell my patients now after reading your book, our job is to have a huge emotional range as if we are grand pianos. And we, I think you might say this in the book, we want to play every single key on that grand piano as much as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a lot in that. Um, the question of why is beyond my pay grade. <laughs> I don't know why. I think, you know, we're in these bodies. These bodies are vulnerable. Our emotional bodies are vulnerable. We're going to know loss. We're going to suffer. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. Carl Jung said something interesting. He said, well, most of us are suffering from illegitimate suffering. In other words, he said, you're going to suffer. But neurosis is illegitimate suffering. It's all of our strategies to try to avoid suffering. So we end up doubling up on our pain. <laughs> right? Yes. By not knowing, not not having, well, we're not taught, basically, how to be with our experience. And you're right, my goal is not happiness. My goal is to be alive. 
And every one of these emotions has vitality in them. Um, and that's what I want, is I want the greatest range of vitality. I want the greatest range of aliveness to come into my experience. And I think that's why we're here as a, as a, as a human being, is to participate in the grand sweep of things, not simply to kind of create a list of positive emotions and negative emotions, mm. you know. And we'll build up the positive and we'll avoid the negative. William Blake, the wonderful poet from the 18th century, said, we must go to heaven for form, but we must go to hell for energy and then marry the two. Mm. He, he knew already in the 1800s that we tend to split off the positive and the negative, even to call it that's a misnomer. Mm. And we push all that down into the shadow, what Jung called the shadow. And that's where our vitality gets caught. Mm. So to do this work is to go to hell. It's to go into the shadows and to begin to redeem grief, anger, outrage, sorrow, melancholy, and to begin to uh, sense the tremendous vitality that's in them. As I say in the book, grief is wild. Grief is feral. It cannot be domesticated. It is something that does not depress us. Because if you're really acknowledging grief, you are really alive. Mm. I remember one woman who was in my office weeping so heavily at the death of her beloved dog. And in the midst of the grieving, she looks up to him at me and she says, I feel so alive right now. Mm. Isn't that true, though? Mm. We're incredibly acutely alive when we're in the touch with sorrow. It is not a deadened state. It is not a depressed state. What is depressing is when we turn away from it. Mm -hmm. When we run, when we hide, when we avoid, we become depressed, oppressed by that weight. That is not the nature of sorrow. Mm -hmm. And so that numbness, it's almost as if all the, I'm thinking about all the ads we see on television and how we speak about grief is about feeling numb. And uh, it's, it's not true. There's a real untruth to that. I was always so confused as I as I matured as a therapist over the last 10 years to see what has come out of certain universities in terms of positive psychology work because it, it just seemed to, it's way too simplified for me. Uh, cogn even cognitive behavioral therapy, all of these things just never, never spoke to me as a therapist. They didn't seem true to what we were really experiencing ourselves or in the rooms with the people that we were trying to commune with to help because so much of it, again, came back down to grief work. And many patients come in feeling or describing being numb. And now I say to them, it's not so much that you're numb, you're actually in that numbness and that, that pain. If you can push past or even acknowledge that you're feeling that, there is an aliveness in that numbness and pain. Right? Yeah, absolutely. I think the positivistic psychologies are... We're fine. I mean, I, I love happiness. What a great thing to have. <laughs> right. The problem is that we're not, we're not always happy. And if that's the only model you're given, if happiness is the ideal, when you're not there, you feel like you're failing. Mm. You're doing something yes. wrong. Yes. And I have to redouble my efforts. And I feel ashamed of this state. Mm. So we have people in, in your office, my office, apologizing for regression, mm -hmm. for not getting up today. I'm sorry I'm for crying. We're conditioned by what I call the heroic ideal. Mm. The heroic ideal gives us one direction to go, which is always up. We're always supposed to be successful, in charge, capable, rising above the problem, not being vulnerable, not being hurt. And always, we like things going up in this culture. We mm -hmm. get very anxious when things go down. Mm -hmm. And grief, sorrow, pain take us down. Mm -hmm. They're a descending motion. motion. And positive psychology is a self psychology. It's not a soul psychology. There's a difference between soul and self. Can you can you speak to that very quickly for people, just so they understand what you mean? Self is more the the uh, kind of constructed image I have of me, mm -hmm. Francis. There's a story I carry about Francis of who he is and the things he does and what he's trained by and his his skills and so forth. That's the self, that's the self-image. But soul has a much deeper 
much broader uh, foundation. Jung would say that we live in psyche, psyche doesn't live in us. Mm -hmm. So in other words, we reside in something much larger than my own self-definition. And that's what I have faith in. When I'm sitting with somebody, I don't know what to do. But if I watch, if I listen, the clues are right there. Psyche is speaking all the time through images, through moods, through feelings, uh, through dreams. It's constantly showing the deeper invitation to what brings us more alive. Not happy. More alive. But, but alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, uh, you wrote, I believe in the book, I, I'm not sure if this is ex an exact quote, but I have here, the goal is being happy. The goal to being happy then becomes a reflection of one's ability to hold complexity and contradiction. Right. To stay fluid and accept whatever arises, even sorrow throughout our days. Yeah, and that would be a wonderful definition of happiness. Mm -hmm. if, I could, if I could see that more as a condition of of embracing what is, and rather than fighting what is, I could call that happiness. There's a wonderful line by the poet William Stafford. He said, we take a breath without pain. We call that happiness. Great line. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. It's more about, as James Hillman, one of my teachers, would say, that the goal of the work is not resolution, not fixing, mm -hmm. but spaciousness. Mm -hmm. How big can I become? Freedom. Can I hold can I hold that? Can I welcome that? Can I get my arms around that? Mm -hmm. That's really the goal of the work. It isn't about perfection. It isn't about happiness. It isn't about getting, my, getting myself you know, all fixed up. That's based on another storyline about it. Unless I do that, unless I fix all the wounds and the potholes in my psyche, I won't be let into the circle. Mm. We live with a chronic anxiety about exclusion. So we have to do this work. People come into my practice all the time with this urgency to change. And underneath it is a profound layer of self-hatred. And I have seen people consistently fail at their agenda because psyche will not collaborate with an agenda of self-hatred. So we have to disengage from that premise. We have to open up the, the wider possibilities of that work that's being done of welcoming of accepting, of engaging. It doesn't mean we don't try to change. It means that the change is not predicated on hatred mm -hmm. or judgment. And I think it's important to say, mm -hmm. I know definitely when I had what I would call a spiritual awakening and started to change my practice uh, quite dramatically, the way I treat patients in part, in part because of your book, Self-forgiveness and learning how to let go of self-hatred and forgive yourself and look at yourself with compassion is a very, very painful process. Is is I spent a lot of hours on my knees in prayer and meditation forgiving myself for things that I had done. Uh, and, and it's massively cathartic, but it's walking into the fire because you really have to take a long, hard look at yourself and why you've done the things that you've done and how hard you've been on yourself and where that learned behavior came from. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> the practice of self-compassion, I find it hard to uh, will forgiveness. Mm -hmm. I think what I can do is create the conditions under which the grace of forgiveness might arise. So that's what the self-compassion is. I can continuously come back to compassion and welcoming. And in that process, some grace sometimes arises mm -hmm. and forgiveness begins to settle over me. Not through an act of will, but through an act of grace. Mm -hmm. in, the, and, in, in that quiet space, when you can cultivate yes. that quiet space. Yes, right. Yes. Right. You say also we are most alive at the threshold between loss and revelation. Every loss ultimately opens the way for a new encounter. That is utterly true. Mm -hmm. That when we take a stance that allows us to be with our losses, something, some new revelation does come upon us. 
one of the most important ones is that uh, we are bound up with every other living thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing revelation. From a, from a conditioned experience of isolation, a, a single cell bouncing off of other cells, what grief slowly does is it begins to teach us that we are semi-permeable membranes, mm -hmm. absolutely entangled with the air around us, with the clouds in the sky, with the other people on the street, with the grass growing up in the sidewalk. We're connected to all of that. Mm -hmm. But we can come to that primarily through an understanding of the nature of sorrow, the nature of suffering. And that is revelatory. It breaks us open to that mm -hmm. possibility. I think you said the key there, which is many patients would hear, many people would hear you say, suffering, how does suffering do that? How does suffering make us all feel connected besides when we do it in a community? How do we feel like we're part of the grass and the trees and the oceans and each other? It, it's that breaking openness. That, that, that's what creates a sense of a next level of enlightenment. And I use that word very carefully because I think when we talk about stages of enlightenment, people can feel shamed that they're not there yet. Where I like to say enlightenment isn't me being any wiser than you, it's just simply coming to another set of truths and or what feels true for your own self and your own soul. I know through my process of being broken open by grief, that's exactly what was on the other side. On the wild edge of that, on the other side of that, on the other side of that grief river was actually an amazing sense of connectedness. So then when I do enter my private sanctuary, when I'm alone, I never feel alone. Mm -hmm. That's the mm -hmm. irony. You sit in that alone space long enough, you break yourself open to it, and all of a sudden you come out the other side realizing you were never alone. And that's a really, yeah, <laughs> that is the, and, and you get to that place, that is the grace you walk around with every day. And all of the neuroses that you might have struggled with before start to melt away. You can't function from that place anymore. That was one of Jung's wonderful insights. He said, most of the issues we face in our lifetime are unsolvable. Mm -hmm. We simply outgrow them. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean, though, to outgrow them? Well, what we're talking about is that process of outgrowing it. That when we are able to, to no longer fight them and resist them, but actually begin to embrace them, we're shown a larger frame that we get to occupy as human beings. And we begin to, I mean, my wounds are all still there. My stories are all there. I'm just not, you know, seeing the world through them. Mm-hmm. They're just simply places of deep compassion for them. That's how I suffered. That's was my experience of suffering. But it's it's no different than yours. You've suffered. Mm -hmm. As so as the person sitting next to you on the bus and the person, you know, reading the newspaper and we have entered the commons of the soul. And in that commons, this is this is part of the deep truth of being alive. Mm -hmm. We will all know loss. Well hopefully all know love. And those two are sisters traveling constantly together. Before we wrap up, I have one question that's on my mind as we speak. Can, can you, I know that I will, I will get this question from listeners as well. Can you speak to how or how you perceive God? How you perceive God in all of this? Or how does that, how does that work? <laughs> You know, did you, does grace, when you talk about a sense of grace and we talk about soul psychology, how does that, how does that relate to our sense of God coming into the picture? It's another one of those pay grade questions. Uh, yeah. uh, um, what I feel, sense, what I've encountered on too many occasions mm -hmm. is something far beyond my mind's capacity to understand. Mm -hmm. There's a word in the Dagra tradition from West Africa, and the word is ilbangura. And the word means the things that knowledge cannot eat. In other words, my mind can't really get around that question. Mm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's a profound mystery. The more I know, the less I know. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a phrase from Meister Eckhart, the German mystic in the 14th century, I think it was. He said, I pray God, rid me of God. Mm-hmm. In other words, any image that I have of it, ain't it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I'm very content to live with mystery mm-hmm. and very open to not knowing anymore. Mm-hmm. And now in my early 60s, and um, the need to know has gotten a lot less... Uh, intense yeah I was going to say obsessive I used to <laughs> <laughs> I had this obsession with understanding it because if mm. I understood it then I probably would be able to resolve my problems mm. but I'm not trying to resolve my problems so much I'm just trying to be inside this life as mm. uh, as fully as I can so God that's a mystery I I asked the question in part because I I um, I'm, I've never, I'm not concerned or I haven't concerned myself too much about trying to figure out that mystery, but I am concerned about the way that our field avoids the question of, uh, it's a soul. I think, yes, you're right. I'm going to jump, just jump in there, but mm-hmm. soul, um, in the old imagination was the intermediary between heaven and earth. Mm-hmm between the abstract, that cosmology of God and the human. For me, there is a profound intimacy between soul and myself. Mm. And, and soul becomes the medium by which I am now connected to everything else around me. The alchemist Michael Sendivogius said that uh, the greater part of the soul lies outside the body. So consequently, it's in every point of overlap between me and a fir tree, between me and a a turtle, between me and the salmon, between me and my grandchildren. It's in that place of overlap that if I'm able to inhabit my uh, soul as it's living outside my body, that's how you and I in this moment now can have any any feeling of intimacy between us. Mm. It's because of the overlap because of where we touch in this between space. So for me, that's the most important piece. Mm -hmm. Soul is this almost uh, viscous quality of touching um, through body, through imagination, through longing, through sorrow, through love, all that's moving around me. And soul invites constant conversation with the living world and with one another. Hmm. There's uh, no way I cannot end there. I I would talk to you all day, but that is just absolutely beautiful. And I'm so grateful that you spent the last hour talking to me about your work. And hopefully many, many other people who will listen to this program. Can you tell us what you're working on next? What's what's in the future for you? Um, I'm working on another book uh, called A Trail on the Ground, which is uh, designed to try to reanimate the primary processes that help shape us as human beings that, for the most part, we have abandoned. Uh, and I'm trying to get back to which is a very uh, non-progressive idea, which is to return, to to go back, to pick up the thread that got dropped. Where did we lose the trail on the ground? Mm -hmm. When did we become so enamored with progress, with technology, with the things of abstraction and dissociation that we've forgotten what it means to be human again? So I'm trying to pick up that thread and see if it can begin to reanimate our imaginations, our our minds, our hearts, our communities, and um, help us come back to earth and come back to our watersheds and come back to one another in a more sensual, um, sustainable, uh, vital way. Mm It's beautiful. And if people want to hear more about your work or find more out about you and your retreats, where should they go? 
They can go to either um, Wisdom Bridge, one word, wisdombridge.net, mm -hmm. or franciswelder.net. Both of them will have current writings and um, calendars and ways to stay in touch from the newsletter and so forth. It's a good way to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much today, Francis Weller, for your time. You are a true gift, and may the light in me shine to the light in you. Thank you, Nell. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you for listening today. It was such a pleasure having Francis Weller on the show. For more information on anything we shared, please go to thedaily.com. That's T-H-E-D-A-L-Y.com. Or email me and my team at Nell, N-E-L-L, -L, at thedaily.com. And join our private Facebook group where you'll have access to more free content, a message board, which I'll be checking in on every day. And that private Facebook group is Daily Unscripted. So let's start building that tribe. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, peace out.